Hi, this is Tia. So the following videos are just a supplement to the workshop that you attended, Empower Your Pelvis, or also known as Self Care for Down There. So you can follow along or you can watch first and then go through the exercises. Feel free to let me know if you have any questions. So you can always email me at tia at the magical art of self care.com. Hope you enjoy. The first exercise that we're going to go through is called pelvic tilts. So you want to start off on a yoga mat or a clean floor. I think this is preferable to do um, on a hard ground rather than on your bed so that you can actually get um, some really good um, tactile feedback. So you're going to start off lying on your back. And it's helpful if you have um, your hands on your hips. So just so you get a sense of the movement of what your hips are doing. And so you're going to start off with um, feeling for where your hip bones are. So um, in the workshop we talked or we went through some palpations. So you're looking for your ASIS or what we call the anterior superior iliac spine. And so you want to start off with, I want you to actually start off with feeling for your low back pressing into the ground. So if it helps, you can use your feet to help to create that effort or of um, your low back pressing into the ground. So you want to actually try to push your feet away from your body. That's going to help to create what we call a posterior pelvic tilt. That's going to allow the low back to press in towards the ground or towards the floor. So you can push your feet away from you and then you can pull your feet towards you. That's going to bring you into an anterior pelvic tilt. So you can kind of think of it almost like you're like a bowl. So you're trying to have your bowl spill forward with the anterior pelvic tilt and you're trying to have your bowl spill backward with the posterior pelvic tilt. And then all the while in between, you're looking for that neutral pelvis. So somewhere in between um, anterior posterior. For some people, this will be really difficult and challenging to do. So you just wanna kind of play with it. If it's really hard, then you can create the same movement um, up against the wall as well. So big thing is that you don't want um, right here, you don't want your chest to be moving back and forth. So you should actually be feeling or getting a sense that it's more the pelvis that's doing the movement for you. The next exercise um, is going to be a wide-legged stretch. Um, so it's going to play with both internal and external rotation of um, the hip bones. And so I'm going to show both a uh, active as well as a passive. I'll start with a passive first um, and then move on to an active. So again, you want to be on a clean floor, a yoga mat, something hard surface is going to be preferable. So you're going to start off with your legs wide. This might already be your starting point. So this might be, um, again, might be challenging to start off here. Um, ideally, what we're looking for is your really great amount of stretch just along the inner thigh. Um, I like to, you know, maybe just start off with wherever your feet fall. So, I mean, if they start to fall in, so if your big toes kind of go towards the ground, then that's where you're getting um, an internal rotation in your hips. If the toes are just kind of, they kind of um, start off where they're pointing up towards the ceiling, then you're pretty much in a neutral position. If they want to kind of splay out a little bit more, then you're in external rotation. So those are the three movements um, that you might notice as soon as you open the legs out. And for the passive stretch that you're looking for, so you just want to be in a comfortable position. I don't want you to try to push your legs out wider than it feels comfortable because I want you to be able to at least maintain it or sustain it for at least 30 seconds to a minute. So you can either hang out here. Um, I don't have a yoga block in front of me, but you can have a yoga block. You can have um, a stack of books. You can even have a chair in front of you as well. So that way you have something to hold on to, especially if you're finding this um, really difficult. And then you're just going to be holding here, just looking for that stretch. I'm going to show a side view as well. So um, when you're, um, if you were to have a mirror and looking at the side view, something that you want to be mindful of is that you're not in this position. So if you started out doing the pelvic tilts um, as the first exercise, what you're looking for here is, I would say, neutral to an anterior um, pelvic, pelvic tilt. So you don't want to be here where you're sitting more on your tailbone. So I want you to actually feel, again, so with that palpation that we did in the workshop, you should feel that you're sitting on your sits bones, or what we call the ischial tuberosities. 
So you can just kind of wiggle back and forth. It should feel that it's pretty grounded there. And then that's where you want to be moving um, into that wide legged stretch, again, where you're holding for 30 seconds um, to a minute. And again, where the positions of your feet um, really, at least for right now, doesn't really matter. Um, if you're feeling a lot of pain in your knees, then I would just walk your feet in a little bit closer so that way you take some of the stress off of your knees. So just coming back to this um, view. So that was the passive. So to do the active, so you can do the passive stretch, again, holding for um, 30 seconds to a minute. And then for the active portion of this exercise, so while one leg falls into internal rotation, so where the toes are gonna be pointing down towards the ground, you're gonna have the opposite leg go into external rotation. So then the pinky toe is gonna be pointing towards the ground. And then you're gonna switch. So then one leg is going into internal rotation, the other one's going into external rotation. And it's just going back and forth. And all the while, I'm not doing anything weird with my pelvis, it's still staying on my ischial tuberosity and just moving back and forth, okay? So um, you might notice that one direction is gonna be a little bit easier than the other. You might even notice that one leg is able to move a little bit better than the other. So, you know, you just work on building, maintaining that awareness, just noticing that difference, um, not putting any judgment on whatever it is that you're feeling. Um, but I like to do this. I don't like to put a time limit to um, some of these, especially the more dynamic exercises, because I like to do it until like, you know, I might feel that initial strong sensation. And then I pretty much go until I don't feel that strong sensation that I felt initially. So again, it could be anywhere from a minute to two minutes, but again, you are the best judge for yourself. So you can go for as long as it feels comfortable. Um, but yeah, give it a try. All right, so the next exercise is 90-90. So preferably um, you would want to have already done the wide-legged stretch just so that you've already warmed up some of the muscles in your hips and your legs. 90-90, um, you're bringing your leg, as you can see here, this is 90-90, you're bringing your leg, especially that um, back leg, into a lot of internal rotation. So, um, because, again, this might not be accessible for a lot of folks, um, again, just based on whatever's going on in your knees, whatever is going on in your hips, then you want to provide some modifications. So, I don't have a yoga block, but I do have this gorgeous ball, which I'm going to be um, showing an exercise a little bit later, but this can work just as well. So, I can, um, if you're feeling a lot of pressure in the back leg, so the leg that's an in internal rotation, I can take a yoga block, I can take a book, I can take this ball, and I could put, um, allow that to rest on top of that book or that ball, and that will take some of the pressure off of my hip so it won't feel as intense. Um, in addition, you might notice that it can be a little bit uncomfortable for that leg that's an external rotation. So then you can put something, just a cushion under there, so that way it's not so much pressure on your knee or on your hip. Um, you might also notice, uh, because I have a lot of internal rotation in my hips, my external rotation isn't as good, but for some folks, you might feel that you might be leaning a lot over onto the leg, onto your externally rotated leg, and not so much in your internally rotated leg, because you just don't have as much rotation there. So then, that might be where you might want to take a pillow, again, you can take a book, and you can place it, if you can't see it, everything's purple, but um, you can just put it underneath, I'm just on the side of you but you can just put it underneath um, your hips or your ischial tuberosity, and that will help to create at least a little bit um, more elevation so the way your hips are a little bit more even and not putting so much pressure um, on your hips, okay? So that 90-90 is a really great uh, way to start to open up the hips. So I'm gonna show, again, this is just a passive, and then you can again hold for about a minute and then you're gonna do the same thing on the other side. So if both of those um, felt pretty comfortable, then we're gonna move into a more uh, dynamic form of this exercise. And so there's lots of um, terms for them. It's like a dynamic 90-90. Um, there's also um, like honey bear as well as an, um, I think it's more like in the CrossFit um, uh, term that they use, actually not CrossFit, but um, another uh, school of thinking um, around mobility. So honey bear is also another um, term that they use for this type of exercise. So I might be kind of moving around a little bit, um, but I'll try to give as many um, views as possible. So you want to start off with both of your legs. They're about 90 degrees, pretty much. 
And so I'm going to be eventually facing in this direction. So I like to have my hands out in front of me. If you need to have um, your hands or your arms to help assist you, then definitely put your hands down. Um, but this is nice because it then it also just kind of starts to tap into um, some of your core. So using um, some of your abdominal muscles in order to help to maintain a little bit of some integrity and stability. So I like to have my arms out in front. So I'm going to start up here. I'm putting a lot of engagements, a lot of work into my legs. So I'm pushing that back leg down. So what I want to do is I want to see if I can get this leg to stay relaxed the whole entire time while I lift that back leg up. So I'm moving from internal rotation all the way into external rotation. I keep continue to keep that leg down as much as I can until naturally that leg wants to lift up. I go from internal rotation into that leg and external rotation in that opposite leg. And then you can hold here or you can just keep it dynamic and then just moving it back and forth. So again, I'm gonna keep that externally rotated leg down while I work on bringing this leg into external rotation. And you might notice some cramping as you move through this. And then you're breathing all the while. Okay, so it's this position. You can even hold right here. That's the honey bear. So as if like you're holding onto a big honey jar, okay? And then I can have my legs or my feet, sorry, um, kind of slightly turned out. Notice also that I'm not dumped into my pelvis. So I'm really staying lifted um, up on my sits bones as much as possible. So I'm not so much on my, um, on my tailbone, okay? So that's gonna be the dynamic 90-90 or moving from honey bear into 90-90 position, okay? And then I like to just play with the um, intensity of it. So you can really focus on just getting, um, having this one leg down, stay down while the other leg lifts up, or it can just, you know, just kind of move freely. It might be, you know, something that you might have done, you know, in other um, exercise or even yoga classes. Um, we're just putting a little bit more emphasis in what it is that we're looking for. So again, if you have the hands down, you're just moving back and forth. So this might also be a little bit more gentler because the knees are bent compared to when we did the wide-legged one and you're moving between the external and internal rotation. All right, so for this next exercise, so we're going to be doing a thoracic stretch. I'm going to show two different options. So I'm out here on um, my deck and I have my patio chair, so you can use your patio chair. Um, I have the fence right here. You can even use that. You can use a wall. Um, you can use the back of your couch. Um, so really anything that you can hold on to is going to be um, accessible or something that uh, you can use. So it doesn't need to be anything fancy. So I'm going to show two different versions um, to do a thoracic stretch. So the first one, you're going to use a chair. You're going to just use the back of it. Sorry, my head might be cut off for a moment, but you're going to stand up. You're going to hold on to the back of the chair. You're going to walk your feet um, as far back as it feels comfortable. So if you've ever done um, kind of like a modified version of downward facing dog in a yoga class, then this can be very similar. So I'm holding on to the back of the chair and I'm going to keep my arms as straight as I can. So try to avoid bending because that's where you're going to get the most optimal stretch. And again, so when we think about the, the thoracic spine, so that's where the rib cage is. So mid part of the back is what we're looking to stretch. So you're going to hold here. You're just pushing the leg as far back as you can. And so the space in between um, your arms is what you want to allow to drop down. Okay, so you should feel nice and on a stretch, maybe along the backs of your arms, along the length of your back. And then again, you're just breathing here. So you're allowing gravity to do some of the work here for you. Again, I like this because it's a pretty passive stretch. You don't really have to do too much while you're holding here. And this is a great stretch to do, especially if um, you tend to do a lot of sitting. So um, if, you have, if you're sitting in a chair, obviously, and then if you're at work or you know, if you work from home, and then you have that chair, you know, just taking, getting up, doing those um, stretching breaks, you can just stand, hold on to the back of the chair, and then move into that stretch. Because again, we spend, we tend to spend a lot of our time where we're just very rounded forward. So whether we're driving, sitting on our computers, sitting on our couches, watching TV. So this thoracic stretch is a great way just to undo all of that movement. 
And so if you can remember the, um, the side view from the workshop where um, you can see, you know, we talked about the diaphragm, we talked about how a lot of those back musculature, you know, have a big impact on the pelvic floor. So we want to make sure that the spine is moving. So it should have um, that same type of movement that we're looking for, because again, if there isn't much movement in the spine, especially the thoracic spine, it's going to have an impact on the diaphragm. And then if it has an impact on the diaphragm, it's going to impact how you're breathing. And if it's impacting how you're breathing, it's going to impact how your pelvic floor diaphragm is moving. So everything is connected. So it's definitely important to take a look and see how your um, thoracic spine is moving. So I'm going to push this chair out of the way. Okay, so next I'm going to show um, cat-cow. So you might be familiar with um, cat-cow um, for those who haven't done it or just need a refresher. I'm just going to review that really quickly. So you're going to come into a quadruped position. So hands and knees. The hands or wrists should be underneath your shoulders. The knees should be underneath your hips. What you're going to do here is going to be pressing your hands in towards the ground. So moving into an angry cat. So you want your pelvis. So now we're moving into a posterior pelvic tilt. So we're allowing the bowl to spill backward. We push the hands in towards the ground. So we allow the thoracic spine to stretch. So we're moving in the opposite direction of what we did when we were in the chair. So we're moving into this rounded back position. And then we move into the cow part of this pose. So where you, the cow, so you allow the belly to drop down. The pelvis is moving into an anterior, posterior, anterior pelvic tilt. And then you're allowing, again, you're looking for that drop of that space between your shoulder blades of that ribcage. So pretty similar to what you're doing um, on that chair. So this is a little bit more dynamic. So I'm just going to move through this without talking. <laughs> I want to make sure that your head is moving as well as it's part of the spine. So if the head is kind of staying fixed while you're moving through it, you're not getting a full benefit of moving through your entire spine. So as you're moving into cat pose, allow the head to drop down, the chin moving towards the neck. As you move into cow pose, then you're allowing the head just to drop up towards the so I showed earlier how to do a supine uh, pelvic tilt. So I want to show how you can do this in sitting. So sitting might be a better option, especially if you have a hard time just kind of getting a sense of what you want your pelvis to be doing. So again, I'm just sitting in a chair. The chair is a little soft on my bottom. So you might want to try um, a little bit of a harder chair like your um, kitchen or uh, dining chair. So you, again, you want to be sitting, so you want to make sure your feet are flat on the ground. Uh, if it helps, if you don't have your back making contact with the back of your chair, so that way you can actually get, um, or actually get a sense of, is your um, spine doing most of the movement for you? Because again, you're looking more for your pelvis. So hopefully you can see, um, I'm just going to lift the arms up a little bit, so hopefully you can see my pelvis a little bit better. But so here I'm in neutral. And then I'm going to move into that posterior pelvic tilt. So yes, I am engaging my abdominal muscles. So my core does have to work in order to help to get me into that posterior pelvic tilt. And then I move into that anterior pelvic tilt. So I'm going to just be moving back and forth. And I actually like to do this with the arms in front of the chest because then it can give me a really great indication if I'm actually moving more through my chest, which is what I don't want. So I want to try to keep my chest pretty quiet. And then I want it just to be movement through my pelvis. So if you're doing this right, so whether you do this on the chair, I think on the chair and on the floor and supine, they're both pretty challenging, but you can really feel, especially moving into that posterior tilt, which I'm doing right now, you can feel those abdominal muscles working. And if you're doing it correctly, you might even feel that the pelvic floor muscle is also wanting to engage and even create a little bit of a lift as well, too. So uh, play with this movement. Just notice, you know, what is really challenging? What's hard for you? What's preventing you from getting into, you know, this movement or getting into that movement? Are you really squeezing through your pelvic floor muscles or tightening through your butt 
you know, that it's not allowing for the pelvis to move. So um, in a little bit, I'm going to be showing some spinal undulations, and that's going to just really take it into a more upright, moving, dynamic um, exercise. So you want to make sure that you have the tilts, the pelvic tilts down first. I would even say, um, have an exercise the cat-cow pose. So that's also going to be a really great um, exercise to do to make sure that you are getting those movements right. Um, obviously, because you want the spine to be moving, but you want to be able to isolate, independently isolate the pelvis first before you're getting through the spine. Because it's easy, I think, for most people maybe to move the spine or maybe they're moving their shoulders, but not actually getting their spine to move and not actually getting their pelvis to move. So spinal undulation is going to be a much more challenging um, exercise. So that's going to be coming up pretty soon. All right, so the next exercise is going to be a standing undulation, and I'll also do a walking undulation. I want myself to just kind of stay within the span of um, the camera, so I'll probably just be walking just a couple of um, short distances. So as I mentioned earlier, so you want to make sure that pelvic tilt, um, you at least feel really comfortable with doing pelvic tilts both in sitting um, and also lying on your back. You should also feel pretty comfortable with doing the cat-cow as well, too. And I actually might show spinal undulation um, on the ground, but I think for most people that's a little bit more challenging. But I'll start with the standing undulation first. So you're going to be standing. I'm just going to show a side view. I actually like to have a wall in front of me, but obviously I don't have a wall in front of me right now. But if you have a wall in front of you, so one thing that I want you to think of is that wall is really close to you. So you're thinking of getting, uh, starting off with your nose or even your chin. So you're getting your chin up towards the wall, and then from your chin, you're getting your chest. So you can think of your breastbone. Then from your best breastbone, then you're getting your belly. From your belly, you're getting the front of your hips, and then you're bringing everything back. And then again, you start with the nose to your chin, so that way you're working on that cervical spine as well. From your chin towards your breastbone, breastbone towards your belly, belly towards the front of your hips, and then you're moving back. Okay, so again, I like to have that wall, so definitely when you're doing this, you can watch me now, but then do this um, up against the wall, because again, you just get that feedback um, to make sure, like, am I getting my nose attached, you know, are you getting that full amount of rotation or backward bend in the neck? Are you actually getting that um, if they're acting extension by getting your breastbone towards the wall? Are you getting that um, lumbar, or sorry, that hip extension with getting your belly, getting the front of your hips towards the wall? So as you move through this undulation, so think of just those points. So nose, chin, breastbone, belly, hip. And knees also as well too. Same thing, I'm also trying to get your knees attached as well. So thinking of all of those points, and then as it feels comfortable, this might take a while, so don't feel frustrated if it, you know, it takes you a couple of days or a couple of weeks for you to really get the smoothness of these movements, that eventually you can move through it a little bit, I wouldn't say faster, but it just becomes a lot smoother. So then you're going to also do the opposite direction. So um, when I first learned this, um, it was told to me almost as if like you're a barking cat. So if you think of if you, if you have a cat and you've ever seen it bark, you know, just how it moves. So you're just going to be doing the opposite direction. So you're going to be doing your knees. So the knees will go first. Then again, you're getting that hip extension. You're getting your belly, getting your chest, your chin, then your nose. So you can think of almost like you're about to bark. But again... <laughs> You want it to be a smooth movement, getting again the knees, then the front of your hips, your belly, your chest, your chin, and your nose. And then the arms are just relaxed as you're doing this. So you're just following along, but all of this should feel super yummy. You know, it's like yummy is a great term, but it should just feel really good for your spine. Um, your spine should be able to move in this way because you're just helping to accentuate all of those different curves in your spine. So the first one you're doing, you're moving in this direction. Okay, so you do that a couple of times, then you can move in the opposite direction, which is always a little bit harder, it's different. Moving into that barking cat, okay? 
Um, so uh, another option, so if that's really challenging to do on the, um, do that standing, so you can do that also on um, your Mac. Again, same thing, it's gonna be a lot slower, uh, a little bit more challenging, but um, you can have, again, on hands and knees, you can curl your toes under, I find that a little bit more helpful. So you're gonna start off with your, uh, again, your tailbone is going to point down, your tailbone is pointing down, and you wanna think, like, little by little, each part of your vertebrae is moving up and up and up and up and up, and then it goes in the opposite direction. So you think of it almost like a cat cow, but it's moving a lot slower. Again, you wanna make sure that head is moving. So I use the this one a lot. Um, I don't as much, I, I feel like I prefer the standing and then also it's more functional because we spend most of our time standing. We're not always on um, our hands and our knees um, when we're you know moving throughout our life. So try the one in standing. Again, use a wall to start off. Um, the ultimate is that then you're moving into uh, walking, walking spinal undulation. So again, I can just start off with this movement first. And then I'll just start bringing one foot forward, the other foot comes forward, and then I'll just turn around and do the same thing. So even while I'm walking, I'm still thinking of trying to get all of those points. I'm thinking of, again, of still continuing to maintain that hip extension. So if you've ever seen dancers, they can do, their undulations are just amazing. So if you want to unleash that inner dancer, then definitely go ahead, you know, do it to some music. It might actually be a little bit more fun than just, you know, doing this weird exercise and, you know, your neighbor, not your neighbor, <laughs> but your, you know, um, your partner or your kids are watching you, maybe they might want to join in. So this is the walking spinal undulation, okay? All right, so next exercise is called a walking um, walking lunge. So this is a dynamic lunge exercise. So if you're familiar with doing lunges, so you're maintaining 90 degrees with both of your legs, that one, you know, is really great. Maybe that's something that you just start off with is just doing a static lunge. Um, I mean, this is challenging already in itself because you have to really work on your balance. Um, the reason why we're doing this um, and why it ties into the pelvic floor, again, so we started out with a lot of these exercises, you know, starting on the ground, then kind of starting to work our way up. And again, as I mentioned earlier, when we were doing the spinal undulation, is that we move around our lives and doing things in an upright position. So, you know, if you've ever been told, oh, like, you know, do a lot of exercises lying on the ground, they're great to start off with. So especially if you're new to this, and if you do have some type of, you know, pelvic floor pain, um, definitely start off on the ground, but again, a lot of the exercises that we want to get to is more functional because we're already, we're up, we're upright, we're, you know, bending down, lifting things up. So we want it to mimic what it is that we're doing in our everyday life. So I like this one um, because, again, it's an upright movement. It's going to really work on lengthening a lot of your hip flexors, your quads. If you spend a lot of time, again, sitting, then everything just kind of gets really short and tight, especially in those hip flexors. So this is a really great way in order to help to lengthen them, but you're eccentrically lengthening them, lengthening them, and it's in a dynamic way rather than just statically as you would do in just like a static lunge pose. Um, and then again, just thinking back to that picture that I showed during the workshop where we looked at some of the muscles in the legs, so especially a lot of those inner thigh muscles. They have, you know, they go all the way towards um, your pubic arch. So if anything is tight here, if you hold a lot of tension, um, if your pelvic floor muscles are tight, then you betcha that the inner thigh muscles are going to be tight. So you want to make sure that those are able to open and move um, dynamically. Okay. So you can start up again, as I mentioned, with just a static lunge. Um, again, just because of the span of the camera, so it's not going to go very far. So I'll just kind of be moving back and forth. So you want to start off 90-90. Um, I think, I mean, I think there's also a misnomer that you can't have your knees over your toes. But again, you know, in real life, if you have to pick something up, that's going to happen. So you should be able to train your body 
to be prepared for when you're out in everyday life because you're not going to always make sure you're in perfect alignment. So I would say it's okay. You know, you can start off with the knees over your ankle, but if the knees go over the toes, notice how it feels. Does it feel comfortable? Are you able to do it? Can you maintain it? Can you do the movement even while you have your knees over your toes? So just experiment with it. I don't think you should be tied to a particular way that you should do an exercise. Like there should be exploration, exploration of your movement. Okay. So obviously holding this is going to be really, really, it's, it's very tiring. Um, but again, you're looking, so you can place your hands on your hips. You want to make sure you're in neutral pelvis. So I don't want, and you can see, I don't want your pelvis to be t dumping forward. So that's an anterior tilt. And I don't want it to be, you can actually work with a little bit more posterior tilt because then you're really going to get more stretch there. But that back leg is going to almost want to kick forward. And then you come into the next side. I'm showing this super, super slow. So, and then you can just turn around. And my floor is really slippery, so it makes it a little bit easier to turn. So if you're on carpet, it might not be so much. But then you're just going to be moving back and forth. You can have your hands on your hips, so that way you can just kind of get some feedback with regards to what your pelvis is doing. But this is a really great um, leg burner. But again, focus is really just on getting those muscles to dynamically lengthen, um, getting that hip extension. So you want to really play with getting that posterior pelvic tilt or even at least neutral. Notice how it feels when you're actually lengthening here. And then you're doing it under load as well too. So you're not just doing it on the ground and just doing you know, some hip extension. You're doing it under load. It's going to feel very, very different. So this is the walking lunge. All right, next exercise is a quadruped hip flex. So I like doing this, uh, especially after having done some of the seated exercises that we did, like the wide-legged um, stretch. Uh, the 9090 moving into the honey bear um, then this is a great way so again we're really building up um, from the ground up to kind of like a mid-level before we get to upright on just getting those hips um, warm and moving so uh, this one has a lot of moving parts to it so i will kind of talk it through and then i will show it without talking um, definitely best to at least watch it a couple of times and then give it a try or pause the video as you're doing it, okay? But I'll at least show um, both sides so you get a sense of um, what it looks like. So I like to start off in Downward Facing Dog. So here I'm in Downward Dog. I'm going to lift up my right leg. As the right leg lifts, I'm going to step that leg forward. And then I'm in a low lunge. So left leg back, that right forward. As I hang out here, especially if my body's pretty cold and I haven't really been doing too much movement, then I might like to kind of shift my body forward and back. Again, just really starting to speak to a lot of those hip muscles and your thigh muscles. And then I'll do that just a couple of times. I'll bring myself back into my um, low lunge. So I'm going to move into a little bit of a twist. So that left hand is going to come down. Right knee is going to come on towards my right, sorry, right hand comes onto my right knee. I'm going to move into a twist towards the right. So I'm going to move right here. So you can either stay right here, or if you're feeling comfortable, or if you're, you know, a yogi, then you can move into um, allowing that right arm to lift up. And allow it even to move into a twist as well, too. And then bring yourself back to your starting position. And then I'm going to bring that back knee down. I'm going to straight down my right leg down. So now I am in a um, modified uh, Hanumanasana or modified split pose because the um, back knee is down. So if you can take a look at, at my hips, then you can see, I'd even look at my back. So you might notice that it's pretty neutral, but I'm not rounding my back a lot. 
you know, taking up, taking to taking into account that I don't have as much flexibility in my right leg, or I'm not, I'm trying not to bend my right knee. So you want your right leg straight. You don't want your um, spine to be lifting up or rounding. So if that's happening because your hamstrings are really tight, then you can try to maintain a neutral spine and then bend that knee. So that way you're allowing the hips to go back. You don't want a posterior pelvic tilt. Um, so thinking of where the hamstrings attach, they actually attach to your ischial tuberosity, so towards your sits bones. So if you're tucking your pelvis under, then you're not getting that full impact of the stretch of your hamstrings. So you do want to try to get more of a neutral to an anterior tilt in your pelvis, even if you can't get that leg straight, okay? So that way you're at least getting where that muscle inserts into the bone, you're at least getting those fibers to lengthen as well too. Okay, so I'm gonna go into um, the full stretch. So I'm here. And then with this foot, I can either keep the toes pointed. This will be, uh, again, hard for some folks because, you know, unless you're a ballerina, how often do you spend time with um, your toes in this type of extension? Probably not very much. So you can move back and forth. You can either stay static here or you can move back and forth. And then you're going to feel a lot more pull on the back of that leg. But it should feel good. It shouldn't feel, you know, too excruciating. So go to a point of comfort for you, but where you're pushing a little bit, okay, so somewhere in between. And you're just going to move back and forth, so kind of flossing a lot of these muscles, even the nerve, especially the big major nerve, the sciatic nerve that runs um, down through this leg. And then I also like to then keep the toes pointing up, and then I go side to side, windshield wiper, again moving through internal external rotation through that hip. And then I come back into my low lunge. So then from here, I'm gonna put all my weight in towards my legs. I'm going to turn, so now I'm facing you or towards the camera, and then I have my hands down towards the ground. Now I'm lengthening through that opposite leg, so all through those inner thigh muscles. So for some folks, they might need to keep their hips up really high. That's totally fine to start off with. You wanna work eventually to try to keep your hips a little low. You're gonna walk your hands, kind of like a spider. <laughs> all the way over towards the other side. See if you can try to drop those hips down. Now you're gonna feel a stretch on the opposite side. Then you're gonna turn. Now you're back into that low lunge. Again, you could shift it forward and back. Bring yourself back to your starting position. Back knee comes down, moving into that modified split pose, keeping the toes down, then lifting it up. So pointing, flexing, through that foot. Then you can keep the toes pointing up, windshield wiper, bring it back down, rebend. Oh, I forgot. So when you're up here, so you're doing that um, low lunge, then you're coming into that twist. So right hand comes down, left hand onto that left knee, come into that rotation. Try to keep that back leg lifted as much as you can. Again, the top arm can lift up or you can bring it back behind you. And then you bring that back knee down and then moving through the hamstrings and then windshield wipers and then back down. Again, press your feet in towards the ground and then coming into a, what they call a Cossack squat, okay? And then hands can come down and then shifting to the other side, okay? So I'll move through that without talking. So I'll actually bring myself back into downward facing dog. I'll start from the top.
So that um, has a lot of moving parts, as I said. So definitely feel free to go through the video, pause it as much as you need to. But I feel like if you at least do this two or three times on both sides, um, and it, instead of just doing those static stretches and just holding those poses, you're actually getting your hips to move dynamically, maybe in ways that you haven't moved the hips in a long time. Um, and again, it's gonna have so much benefit for your pelvic floor, so give it a try. All right, next exercise is dynamic hamstring stretch. So um, if you have already done the um, hip flow, the quad in the quadricep position, quadricep hip flow, then you might notice that your hamstrings might be really, really tight. So this is going to be a great way in order to get some movement through your hamstrings. So I like this again because it's more dynamic, you're moving, you're not holding the stretch. So what you're doing here, again, I'll be just moving through a couple of distances. Um, but you can get the point that you can actually move across um, the room or across the floor um, wherever you're at. So again, I like to put my hands on my hips so I get some tactile feedback as to what my hips are doing. I'm going to bring my, um, I'm going to start with my right leg. So my heel comes down. Like obviously with all these exercises, you can do it with your um, with socks or with your shoes. I like to use or go barefoot so I can actually feel what my feet are doing and just kind of get better grip, especially with some of the things that I need to do with my feet. So the right leg is going to be straight. That left knee is going to be bent. And again, I'm getting that pelvis to tilt um, forward. So into your tilt, keeping that spine um, as neutral as you can. Again, you're looking to try to get uh, the, the sit bones to be pointing as far back as you can. So you should be feeling not just in the, the middle of part of your belly, of your hamstring stretching, but you feel it all the way up towards the where it inserts along your ischial tuberosity. So you're coming into the stretch, keeping those toes pointing up so you get that full length of the muscle lengthening, and then you lift up and then you switch. And then you can turn around and again. So definitely notice is one side a little tighter than the other. Um, if you ha are someone who has suffered from any type of um, sciatica, then this might be pretty aggravating um, to this area. But you do want to be able to make sure that those muscles are moving around the nerve. So you might not want to go into the deepest amount of stretch. So even if you just do a little bit, or you can even keep the foot down and still do the same thing. So you can still get a little bit of benefit or, you know, not have the foot fully flexed. So you can just kind of find a mid, mid um, range to work with, but it's still going to be really helpful because you want that muscle to be moving, um, especially um, if you have had sciatica um, in the past. So give that a try and let me know if you have any issues with that. All right. So now we've gone through a lot of different exercises. Um, and so we're progressively working our way up again towards functionality. So with everything that we're doing, we want to make sure that we can be able to, you know, pick up our kids, move our furniture, you know, load the dishwasher, reach all the way up high, whatever it is, um, everything should be functional. You know, that should be the purpose of movements of exercise um, is to meet a certain purpose, you know, not just for the aesthetic. Of course, the aesthetic is always really nice too. Um, so this next one is, we're going to start off in tall kneeling. So tall kneeling is this position. Um, if this doesn't feel comfortable for you, you know, grab some pillows, an extra yoga mat, whatever it is that you need. Um, and then we're going to be going from a squat into a stand. So if squatting is a little bit um, challenging, I'm not reviewing squats um, in this series of exercise videos. Um, I will probably cover that at a later time. And then also definitely for sure in the online course. Um, but you can definitely go on YouTube and you can find some videos of some really um, easy to start. I would recommend um, any of Katie Bowman, Nutritious Movements, where she has some really great preparatory exercises for squatting. So I would probably start with that first. Um, but going from tall kneeling into squat to stand. So if you're going to be in tall kneeling here, again, um, this is a great one because you're just working on that hip extension. You know, see if you can at least really maintain it. And then you're going to be moving back. So again, you can have the arms out in front of you. You're going to be sitting back onto your heels. 
shifting into a squat, coming all the way up into a stand, okay? And then you're gonna be moving back. So you bring the arms out in front of you, moving back, you're moving into a deep squat, coming back into, onto your knees, coming back into that tall kneel, okay? So then moving back with the um, hips on your heels, shifting into that squat. So this might be, the this transition can be challenging for some folks. So even if you just break it down, moving into that tall kneeling, heels on your hips, and then moving back into that squat, you can just kind of practice that. You can even have your hands on the ground and just working on that transition back and forth. Again, you do need to have that core stability in order to then be able to transition and then even to come up into standing. So again, all these exercises, they're moving from you know pretty um, beginner, easy to intermediate. This is, I would definitely say, a more advanced um, exercise, um, but I wanted to at least be able to offer that to those who feel that they can do this, okay? Um, so again, just to review, so you're starting off in tall kneeling, starting off in tall kneeling, coming back, shifting into a squat, deep squat, then coming up to stand. Um, on all this again, why are we doing this? Because you do have to come into a deep squat if you're um, picking something up and going to the ground and then bring it close into your body before you stand up to go and pick it up, whether it's even picking up your kid. So again, you know, we're coming back to function. Um, so give that a try. Um, again, if you need to kind of start off small, even if you just start off with squatting, you know, just start off with squatting, um, it will be a, a video that I will be covering at a later date, so you can look out for that, um, especially if you're interested in doing the um, online course. All right, last exercise I'm going to cover. Again, this is another um, advanced exercise. Again, we're just looking to integrate everything that we've learned so far um, from, again, starting low to the ground, working our way up into quadruped or into tall kneeling and then coming all the way up into standing. So this one is calling rolling like a ball. So this is a really great exercise um, just because it really integrates uh, a lot of the squatting components, a lot of the core components, um, just the dynamic extensibility of your leg muscles as well too. And then I like it um, specifically um, because it looks at just the ability for the spine to be able to move into extension and flexion. Um, and so for some folks, you know, they might already be in a very, especially without a lumbar spine, their low back, they might already be in a very um, flexed position um, and not as much extension. Um, for me, I tend to hold myself in more um, extension. Uh, I have a lot of hamstring flexibility, but not as much flexibility in my lumbar spine, even though it looks like I do, actually a lot of it is coming from my hamstrings. So this one is a really great exercise that I like to do. So I'm gonna break it down a little bit slower and then into what it should look like. So I'll do that also without talking. So you're gonna start off on the ground. Again, flat surface is preferable. You're gonna come onto your back. You're gonna hug your knees and towards your chest. So again, you should feel for your low back pressing in towards the ground. So I like to actually start off, especially if you're new to this exercise, to have your hands uh, under or behind your knees rather than in front. The front is gonna be a lot harder, so you can definitely check that out for yourself. Um, so you're gonna have it just behind your knees. You're gonna keep that tucked in. So you're going to be really engaging your hip flexors as well as your abdominal muscles while you're here. And then you're gonna lift your head up. So your chin is gonna be moving in towards your chest. So the legs will move. And you're just gonna start with rolling. this might be enough for some folks. So again, you might see that as I roll, especially um, as I roll for my thoracic spine to my low back, it's not very smooth, again, just because I don't have as much flexion. So this is something that I'm still working on. So you can just start off here just rolling, just getting that movement in your spine. And then you can see if you can come all the way up into a sitting position. So you're rolling, Roll to sit. Roll to sit. So then next, you can roll into sit and then into a squat. So you're going to kind of pop up into a squat. So again, you're going to roll. You don't have to hold on. Pop into a squat. Roll. Pop into a squat. 
the next roll pop into a squat and then stand okay and then you just do the opposite as you make your way down you pop back into the squat and then you roll pop into a squat and stand okay so there might be that initial where you want to almost fall back that's where you need to use your abdominal muscles in order to help to keep you forward so that way you can be able to stand up so i like this because again it's, it's a full body dynamic um, exercise that you can really use okay so i'm going to show it just um, without talking So there's that like temporary pause when I'm here. Again, that's just so I can maintain, catch my balance before I come back up into a stand. So just making sure that, um, you know, that feels comfortable for you. Um, again, just start off with some of the um, starting the slower points of just rolling first, getting comfortable with that. Again, I'm going to be coming up with another video just talking about more squatting components. So that at least the squatting aspect uh, feels comfortable for you before you take this into the more dynamic part of the